Hi students, welcome to HSC Earth and Environmental Science. This is module six on hazards and video number 19. We're going to continue this little mini series on technologies associated with predicting hazards, volcanoes, earthquakes, and the East Coast lows. So this one, we're going to focus on earthquakes. Same learning intention as the last one, except this time we're going to focus on technologies related to predicting earthquakes. And we're going to look specifically at ground movement detectors, anomalous animal behavior, and strain meters. In looking at the success criteria, we want you to be able to make sure that you can link some technologies to the detection of earthquakes to understand how they can be used in predicting earthquakes, not just in their location, but in their magnitude. And more importantly, how effective these technologies are in predicting earthquakes. So our second major hazard to have a look at in terms of technology is earthquakes. We know they, like volcanic eruptions, are significant geological hazards, have the same concerns associated with them. That is, they require predictions of date, time, uh, location, which would be the epicenter for earthquakes, and also magnitude. Without any one of these, uh, all we're doing is providing some generalized information. It's going to be in this area, or it's going to be sometime on this day, uh, or we think that it's going to be a, a magnitude three, five, seven, this sort of thing. This is why uh, earthquake prediction is actually one of the most challenging areas in science and one that we really haven't got a good handle on as yet. To be successful in being able to predict earthquakes sufficiently early enough to be able to move people out of areas where they are potentially affected is not something that we've been able to do um, very well as yet. However, we do have a few technology tools at our disposal, so we'll look at how a couple of these can be used in order to try and help us with this very difficult process of predicting earthquakes. We're gonna look at three things in particular and the uh, principles behind each of these, well, between behind two of these three anyway, um, is very similar to what we looked at when we were talking about volcanic eruptions, specifically in relation to ground movement detectors and strain meters. In addition, we've seen some interesting effects of uh, animal behavior that's been associated with earthquakes, but we'll have a look at this in a bit more detail too. So when we're trying to monitor earthquakes, there's three areas we want you to have a look at. And again, I've given you the same table that we looked at for uh, volcanic eruptions, because I think they're the same things you want to look at. So we've got our three uh, factors, our ground movement detectors, our animal behavior, and our strain meters, which are the three things that are specifically mentioned in your syllabus. So therefore, they're things you need to make sure that you're aware of. So what are ground movement detectors? Well, we looked at these in the previous video. They're seismographs. They produce uh, a range of different seismograms. They can be used for triangulation to determine the epicenter and the focus of a particular earthquake. They can also be used particularly in combination with GPS, um, satellite technology, to look at displacement. So if there's any areas of displacement, if the um, surface of the earth is is moving up or down in any way, um, these sorts of early warning systems can, can detect some of these changes. Sometimes the timing isn't as good as we would like. When we look at ground movement detectors, one of the, th one of the key things that may be useful for us is to um, try and analyze pre-shocks and aftershocks. Sometimes we get an initial earthquake and then sometimes we get some quite significant aftershocks. Sometimes the first earthquake that comes through isn't necessarily the biggest one. So we could even regard that as a pre-shock. And if we've got data about that, then we can analyze that data and we can determine whether or not we think um, that there's a level of, uh, that there should be a level of uh, moving people out of an area, or at least warning them that something's coming along to take whatever precautions they can. But often this is a timing uh, question. How long do we have between when we know something's going to happen and when it actually happens? So this sort of technology could help us to, pre to predict subsequent major quakes, but perhaps only of a very short term, uh, sh short term duration between 
where we have our data and where the actual quake and when the actual quake is going to hit. Animal behavior has actually an interesting history. And um, as far back as 373 BC in Greece, we've got records of animals behaving in unusual ways, often associated or after the fact often associated with some sort of geological events. And one of those where we do see um, a number of different records associated with earthquake activity um, is in the change in behavior of animals that where they are doing something that they wouldn't naturally do. So um, snakes avoiding burrows, uh, birds, uh, water birds avoiding going into ponds or waterways, uh, animals migrating or moving out of an area um, en masse very quickly with no apparent reason for why they're doing that. At best, the study of animal behavior in terms of its ability to predict um, hazards or disasters like earthquakes is a very imperfect science. We've tried a lot um, of different methods, a, a lot of different animals to try and work out whether any of them are any better than any others in, in this science of trying to predict earthquakes but we haven't found any compelling evidence that suggests that they're able to do this. There's, I guess, a, a, an important difference here between detection, which we think animals can do. Animals do seem to be able to feel some of those very minor shakes that we can't detect uh, with anything other than our most sensitive instruments. But whether or not we can actually use the detection that animals can feel uh, to actually act as a predictor of an event that's about to happen, well, that's a slightly more difficult problem. And that's certainly one at the moment that we haven't been able to solve. And in terms of strain meters, well, as we looked at for volcanic, uh, volcanic eruption monitoring, these uh, strain meters are, are deeper, they're, they're under the ground. They're trying to measure very, very minor um, changes that are happening. They're incredibly sensitive and incredibly precise, and they pick up the smallest movements. But once again, the problem with this particular technology is it's often most useful after the fact. And this is the problem that we have in trying to be successful in our early warning systems associated with um, upcoming earthquakes is we're just not really good at being able to find a sort of technology that's going to give us a decent window of time ahead of time to be able to um, provide sufficient time and information for people to be able to move out of the potential um, danger zone if an earthquake is about to hit. Often these things happen um, with limited warning uh, with limited um, pre-data for us to analyze. And by the time uh, we know what's going on, it's already happening or there's just not enough time to deal with it. Of course, the fact that things haven't been solved means they are always going to be a problem for someone to solve. And this has been one of the great things, one of the things that I love most about science is that there are always more questions. There are always more questions for you to get your head around to try and solve. And science has continued to move forward with people who've looked at creative, different, um, alternative solutions to problems that exist. And sometimes those problems have required a lot of thinking outside the box. An outside the box theory around earthquake prediction is the seismic gap theory. There's some interesting information around the seismic gap theory. And one of the things that we might just have a little bit of a look at in class, remember, one of the key things is that we haven't really solved this problem of um, early warning systems and successful prediction of earthquakes. So let's analyze another theory and see whether or not there's any reliability and validity in the seismic gap theory. That's something we'll have a look at in class. Thanks for watching.